episode 10 of Travel Tribe, where we invite some of the most quirky and inspirational adventurers as they share some of their stories and adventures from abroad, whether it is working, studying, or our guest today helping the endangered wildlife out in Africa. Today, I'm super excited to have on our show the Rhino Mom. We are over the Tiger King. He was so spring 2020. It's on for summer 2020. And we have the Rhino Mom, Jamie Trainer here, who has volunteered with the Rhino Orphanages out in Africa. She'll be telling us a little bit about her journey, how she got involved, and what she's doing now studying vet medicine. So let's go ahead and bring out Jamie onto the show. Hey, good to see you again. I haven't seen you in like one minute. <laughs> I know, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> oh man, we always get ready for tech issues and that uh, last one was one of our best ones where we did a whole show and we just had an empty box. So <laughs> <laughs> anyways, I'm excited for part two of our show uh, now that we've already been through it again, but I'm super excited. So Jane, where are you joining us from today? Um, so I am in Pretoria in South Africa. Um, it's not the most exciting city, but it's close to the university where I study. So yeah. And how's the uh, situation out there with the pandemic going on? Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> We're still on lockdown, so it's not really fun. And yeah, we've had to switch all of our studying to online learning, which is an adjustment, but mm -hmm. it's not too bad. Okay, good. So uh, we have you on today because you have a great story. You were actually recommended to us by one of our former guests who said, you have to interview this girl. She does fantastic <laughs> things. Um, and so before we get started, I wanted to learn a little bit more about your inspiration for working with rhinos. Where did it come from? Um, so I've always, I've always loved animals and especially wildlife. Um, I grew up here in South Africa and I've had the privilege of going to the bush, going to um, wildlife game reserves to see just to see the most amazing sightings and yeah so I always knew I wanted to do to work with animals and wildlife mm -hmm. and then it was straight off to school I didn't want to go and study so I decided to go and volunteer at a wildlife rehab center mm -hmm. and that's where I met a little rhino named Danny who just she's the cutest thing in the world and I just fell in love with her like you just you become the 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 rhino mom you know and and you become the whole world and it's an amazing experience and then from then on yeah i was in love with rhinos <laughs> and so what kind of animals uh were you guys working with out there at the uh, rehab center uh so that rehab center had everything i mean we had a baby giraffe named malman who was hilarious <laughs> and we had smaller creatures so we had baby well but it, it wasn't only baby animals actually it was also a lot of injured animals uh we rescued a lot of animals that were caught in snares or hit by cars or even some places wanted to relocate. There was a problem leopard. So we would go out, trap the animal and relocate it, which is really thrilling because leopards are terrifying when you get up yeah. and close yeah. to them. Um, that growl sends shivers down your spine. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, the animals, the variety of animals we had there was incredible. So you guys had leopards, you had rhinos, giraffes. What were the other ones? Squirrel, bush baby, warthogs, birds. Every, everything, any African animal you can think of, it was there. <laughs> okay, wow. Uh, so you just fell in love, love at first sight, and you said, this is what I want to keep doing, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It became my goal to to, to continue working with uh, wildlife and saving them and rescuing them. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, then eventually I found the best way to do that was to, to now go and study vet. Yeah. So, yeah, great. Well, before we get into that, can you tell me a little bit more what kind of animals end up at these rehab centers or what are the reasons that they end up there? Uh, well, the, the biggest thing is is human problems. So uh, biggest thing with rhinos at the moment is poaching. Um, I mean, there's also other animals being poached like uh, the pangolin, which mm -hmm. is a kind of scaly anteater. It's an amazing animal, but it is the most trafficked mammal in the world. And a lot of people actually don't know about it because it doesn't get a lot of tension. Um, so yeah, it's really sad. And then there are other things, you know, there's a lot of snares out in the bush. We had a porcupine once that had a snare wrapped around its its stomach. And I mean, it went into the skin. It was really bad. But luckily mm -hmm. we managed to, to help it and the wound healed and we got to release it. And then, yeah, a lot of animals hit by cars. So 
you don't want to intervene with nature with uh, natural things obviously you're not going to go stop a lion from eating a giraffe but anything that's a human problem is where yeah they need our help yeah you're gonna be stuck the lions and hey stop <laughs> we're protecting yeah. uh, our giraffe friend here <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. you don't want to interfere so speaking of poaching how has the problem been since you've been involved working with rehab centers has it been getting better has it been getting worse um, well, when I first started going, when I first worked at this wildlife rehab center, poaching was at one of its highest, um, and especially this is now with rhinos. And that's actually what made me decide that I wanted to work more specifically with rhinos because they needed the most help. Um, and that's when I found the rhino orphanage. But I, I do know that the, the numbers are decreasing now these past few years, but you know, I can't say, I mean, it's good to hear that, but you don't know if it's also because there's now less rhinos to poach. Um, mm -hmm. But hopefully it's more because security has increased, the rhinos are being protected more, and that uh, maybe, maybe there's an end in sight. I don't know. Hopeful thinking. What kind of measures are taken to help protect the rhinos? Um, so it's, it's pretty much just security, just protection for the rhinos in uh, anti-poaching units. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to do with the canine anti-poaching units as well. They do amazing work, um, go out and... I mean, they, they're out in the bush there. They're in the middle of, it's a war, you know, the, the rhino poaching crisis. It really is a war because these guys don't come with little things. They come with huge guns and they're ready to just shoot to kill. You know, they, they don't care. So it is, it really is hectic. And it, even when I was living at the rhino orphanage, you know, you do get scares as well because if poachers come there, that, they're not the kind of people you want to run into. But yeah, so it's, it's just big anti-poaching units is the biggest thing. And so these poachers, can you describe the kind of people that are doing this? Um, so, yeah, so you get the, the poachers that are on the ground actually doing the work um, and they'll get paid a certain cut of it. And it's pretty much, it works in the same way as drug trafficking and all the other kinds of trafficking in the world, I suppose. Um, so then there's the kingpin, you know, the, the rhino horns will go to these guys. They'll get it across to Asia because the demand is coming from Asia. There's absolutely no use for a rhino horn. Yeah, there's no people here that demand it. So it's, yeah, unfortunately, it's all coming from there. And um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. pretty hectic because these guys will do, I mean, if you off you're offering them a large sum of money to go and get this rhino horn, unfortunately, they're going to do it. You know, they want, they need money or, you know, so it's, so yeah, it's not a, it's not a nice situation. And what, what are these rhino horns being used for in Asia? Um, well, I've, I've heard some, some crazy things like they were used, um, People were snorting rhino horn, crushing it up and snorting it. I'm, I'm not sure what they think that does, but also it's used as a symbol of wealth um, in a household and uh, yeah, other weird medicinal things that have absolutely no scientific proof to back them up. So. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I, I'm also a diver and you know we have the same kind of situation with sharks as they are really hunted for their shark fins, especially in, in China for the shark fin soup, which is a sign of wealth maybe some other kind of powers that they believe it gives them and it's, it's it's brutal the way that they go about you know just cutting off the fin and they just throw the sharks into the ocean to just you know helplessly die and it is really sad and the population of sharks has really decreased because of that yeah it's really horrible it's happening to a lot of animals across the world and it's really and it, it is it's brutal like you said you know with the rhinos as well they they often hack off half the face i mean the rhino horn is not it's not just sitting on top of the skin, it's deep into their face. So to get the most out of it, they, they actually hack away half the rhino's face. And then what they do as well is they'll leave the rhinos there alive like that. And, you know, rhino is lucky if, it, if it's found the next day and it can either be euthanized because, you know, if it can't be saved or hopefully it can be saved. Um, there is an amazing organization called Saving the Survivors. And they actually go out to these rhinos, the ones that are really, you know, I've seen them treat some hectic cases and they've actually managed to save a lot and they do amazing work. And so how do they go about doing the process? Do they sedate the rhino, then shoot it and kill it and take the horn? Or what's the process like? Uh, well, it depends on the poachers, but yeah, a lot of the, the new thing is to, to actually sedate the rhino because it's quieter, but, um, you know, it's not like a, a gunshot. And then they'll take the horn and then the rhino wakes up with half its face missing. And it's horrible to see. I've seen it before and it's, it's, oh, it's gut wrenching. It's really, really bad. And then 
Yeah, this is where the rhino orphanage comes in because a lot of the time these rhinos have babies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, there have also been um, times where the poachers have killed the babies as well for that tiny amount of horn that they've got or the babies got in the way and the poachers either killed it just because it was in the way or they've attacked the baby as well. Um, and then that's when the rhino orphanage gets a call to go out and save this now orphaned baby rhino. But are there any severe consequences if these poachers are caught? <laughs> there should be. I can't say they're that severe because, mm. yeah, the, the, I don't know, this country and our system. So that's where you kind of come along with the, with the rhino orphanage. So you volunteered at the rehab center. And then tell us a little bit about the, the orphanage that you ended up working at. Um, so, yeah, so I went after the rehab center. I researched the whole lot and I found the rhino orphanage. And I actually went there and I started as a volunteer there as well. And then after three months of volunteering, I told them I wasn't leaving and that <laughs> I needed a job. <laughs> and uh, they were happy to offer me one. So that worked out well. Um, but yeah, and I ended up working there for three years. It was amazing. It's just that place is like my home. I, I go visit as often as I can. Obviously now with, with Corona, I can't go there because it's about two hours away from me. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't mm -hmm. been there in a very long time, which is hard, but I go whenever I can. What is the process like in order to volunteer at one of these places? Is it selected? Um, or? Yeah, so with the Rhino Orphanage, a lot of the volunteer programs in the country um, is, you know, you can contact them, you pay a certain amount, and you can go for two weeks to three months, whatever you like. But the Rhino Orphanage is a selection-based process. So um, you have to contact them and then it's you actually don't pay to volunteer there because it's so selective and because you're there for three months. They, you know, they want people who are really committed to it because they have had in the past where people come all the way there only to turn around and go home and then you're stuck with no one. So that's mm -hmm. a bit silly. Um, so yeah, and the three months is also so that people can be trained properly uh, because the volunteers become like staff. You know, you need to be able to depend on them as well to sleep with the rhinos and feed the rhinos, you need to train them properly. Uh, it's also very important for the baby rhinos to, that we don't want people changing every two weeks. It's very stressful for them. Um, they really do form very strong bonds to people. So having people there for three months is a lot better for the rhinos as well. Some of like programs, for example, when I was in Asia where they would have expats or travelers coming in who would teach their English to their students for like two weeks and then they'd keep rotating, but it was just heartbreaking for the kids because they get attached to yeah. somebody and all of a sudden two weeks later they're gone and you get yeah. a new place. And so I can imagine yeah. experience the same situation. And so it's it's a minimum of three months, right? You just can't come in and take an Instagram photo and, and head out, right? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> no, and it also, you know, it depends on the, how long you've been there, whether you get to do certain things and work with certain rhinos. It, it's always changing there. There's always different rhinos around. Obviously, the bigger, the older rhinos, you don't want volunteers going in and, and possibly getting hurt by them. So they would more work with the younger ones. And oh, yeah, it's, it's always different there. <laughs> through uh, like a typical day to day or week uh, working at the rhino orphanage. All right, well, you're, the day changes every day, but I'll try and I'll sum it up. Um, so if they are young rhinos, we generally sleep with them, which is so much fun. And you usually get woken up by a baby rhino sucking on your arm because they're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a friend shame. This one rhino, for some reason, loved to pee on the mattress because we would take mattresses in because you don't want to sleep with them on the concrete floor. And there's a mattress for the rhino and a mattress for the human. Although you end up on the same one. And uh, <laughs> this rhino loved to pee on mattresses. And we actually got it on the camera footage where you see her getting up during the night and this girl didn't wake up and the rhino turned and peed on her head. And it was the oh, best thing no. ever. Best thing ever. My friends after a night out, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it was brilliant. Oh, goodness. But anyway, so after you've slept with the rhino and you're now very tired from your, from your night of feeding, uh, you then take them for a walk out in the bush. And yeah, it depends on how, how young the rhinos are, but you would go for a couple hours. How long they want to go for, you kind of budget on them. And that is so much fun because they love to play. And you go and find a, a mud wallow and they roll in the mud. And then you get in the mud with them. That's the best. You get full of mud. It's so nice. But there's, there's a really cool tree in South Africa called, called the toilet paper tree. 
So you can actually wipe your hands on it. You wipe all the mud off, which is uh, fun. And then, yeah, after walking around the bush, you go back, and then there's a lot of feeding during the day because um, there's usually quite a couple of baby rhinos that need milk and a lot of other little creatures like buffalo, baby buffalo and zebras and that. They also need milk. And then there's a lot of cleaning. I'm trying to envision what it's like to walk around. <laughs> Are you walking with yes. Does it just follow you like a dog? Do you have to have treats in your hand? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, lots of people have asked if we take the rhinos for walks on leashes, but no, uh, there's no way of controlling a baby rhino. You cannot tell them what to do. They do what they want to do when they feel like doing it. So the walks, you literally just run out the gate with them. They love to follow. They, they're they made to be with their mom. And you know in that situation, you're their mom. So they stay with you. There are some naughty rhinos that run away. And then you spend your whole walk running after them in the bush and it's stressful and it's oh, we've also had some rhinos that didn't want to come back so we i would i remember having to phone one of the girls and saying it's eight o'clock at night i'm still out in the bush with these two rhinos like we couldn't get them back inside it was crazy uh -huh. yeah, it's fun though what do you do to entice a rhino back to its uh <laughs> it's home <laughs> well <laughs> that's tricky they are very food motivated but yeah, yeah sometimes that doesn't work either so you kind of just got to keep calling them keep walking um if they're alone they usually follow quite well because then they don't want to be left in the bush alone you know we had mm -hmm. one rhino named uh lunga and he was very confident you know he would run off to the bush didn't care if you went with him but if he was alone for longer than 10 minutes he started getting a bit worried he got a friend and once he had this friend that was it they were gone and then he didn't care if he was alone because he had her so a bit of an issue but anyway yeah it's fun. It sounds like they all have their own unique personalities huh yeah oh my goodness their personalities are insane they are so funny like i mean i used to think it as well when you when you drive in the bush and you see rhinos in the wild they do look you know a bit boring and slow and prehistoric and you're kind of like okay it's a rhino you know but when you get to know these little rhinos they are hilarious they are so funny they just I can't even tell you the stories that I've got of them. <sighs> yeah. And they're also different. I mean, some of them are super trusting and they want to, I had a baby rhino named Kumba when I first got there. He was glued to my side. So he actually walked around the orphanage with me doing like the cleaning and that. And he used to pull the rakes around and make a mess. Um, and then, yeah, you get other rhinos like Lunga, who was Mr. Confidence and did whatever he wanted. So it's brilliant. <laughs> Where are the kind of people that are usually attracted to showing up? Do you have a lot of locals, international people, vet students? Uh, well, usually it is more international people, actually, um, that want to come and volunteer. And it's just it's people with that same passion and that, I want to say, obsession for rhinos because yeah, that's what you got to have. To do all of that, It's a, it, it can be a hard job and it can be challenging at times. So you've really got to have that passion for them. Otherwise... You, you just don't enjoy it, you know? So I've met amazing people who have come to the Rhino Orphanage. I mean, all of my best friends are from there. And I still, I, I've gone to visit one of them in Australia and they've come back to South Africa to do trips with me. So it's amazing. What were some of, what are some of the perks uh, other than, of course, getting to walk the rhinos? Oh, there's just so many perks. So uh, sleeping with them, as, as horrible as it was during the night, getting up at 3 a.m. to make milk, it's it's so much fun it's so nice like i can't even describe it because you don't really sleep because you have to be awake in case they wake up and stand on you or something mm -hmm. but it is it is so much fun and for they come and cuddle next to you they sleep right on you and it's so nice i can't oh i love it i love it and uh what are maybe some of the hidden downsides or the less glamorous part uh that you wouldn't see on instagram of working in these orphanages a lot of poop cleaning or yeah, there's a lot of a lot of poop cleaning, a lot of scrubbing of the the rooms where the rhinos sleep. Um, there's also a, there is the sad side as well where you, you where you lose a rhino, um, which has happened. I mean, obviously, you know, but yeah. So that's the sad part. The challenging part is more when they first get there and you've got to try and earn their trust. It is insane. I mean, they have no idea what's happened to them. They're terrified. They've just come from the bush with their mom this concrete room with this two-legged creature and um yeah you've got to try and earn their trust and it's a lot of talking to them because they rely so much on hearing and smell 
you literally, I would sit and read. I'd read books sitting outside their room. And then it's being brave enough to go inside the room and possibly get bashed a lot. <laughs> so you come out with lots of bruises, but oh yeah, it's worth it. When they do trust you, it's, it's insane. The bond that they form with you is incredible. Yeah, I can imagine. We have one of uh, the viewers here, Mark, who said it would mean the world to him if you can uh, nickname one of his rhinos Mark. So, <laughs> oh, the people I study with, it's terrible. <laughs> and uh, are there also vets that that also reside at the premises? Yeah, so there's there's one vet that works uh, with the rhino orphanage. He's not there twenty four seven, um, so he. He oversees everything. So everything, anything that um, medical that we needed to talk to him about, we would just phone him. He'd either come over and sort it out, or he would just tell us what to give them. Um, but yeah, he's amazing. He's. I need to work with him one day as well. He's such an inspiring vet. Yeah, uh, we had a question from one of our viewers saying, "What's a rhino's sleep schedule like?" <laughs> uh, they sleep opposite hours to what you want to sleep, pretty much. <laughs> so whenever you're tired and you're trying to go to sleep, they're awake and they want to play. And then when they're sleeping, it's daytime and you've got to do other work. Um, but yeah, pretty much they sleep during the night. They sleep most of the night. So mm -hmm. you would give them their main like last feed at about 9 or 10 o'clock. And then uh, they'd sleep. They're usually really good at sleeping till their next feed. Unless they're very hungry, then they wake up and, and wake you up as well. And what do these uh, rhinos feast on? What do they feast on? A lot of milk, <laughs> a lot. Um, so some of them go up to about 24 liters of milk in a day. And then that's spread out, depending on the age of the rhino, either you start off with hourly feeds and then it goes to two hours and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then they eat a lot of what we call dry food. So it's like pef, grass, um, Lucerne and then rhino pellets, which they love. And so how long will the rhinos actually stay at the rehab center? Are they there for a certain amount of time or when they, they get too big and you're saying, hey, there's not enough room here or the bruises become too big on your body? How do you know it's time for the <laughs> rhinos to finally cut the ties with you and go on to their merry uh, little rhino world? Um, okay, well, we base it pretty much on what they would do in the wild. So they would stay with their moms till they're about two to three years old. And um, so that's usually the age where you start like thinking about it, but it also depends on the rhino. So some rhinos are a lot more imprinted onto humans. So if they've arrived at a very young age, they had a lot more time with us. And then unfortunately, they, they're a lot more used to people. So you, you might need to prolong that stage of cutting ties so that they get a bit more used to being a rhino. But mm -hmm. what actually works really well is if a rhino comes in, that's around, because so we wean them when they're, 16 months, that's when they, their milk is finished because um, that's also what they would get in the wild. But if a rhino comes to the orphanage that's around a year old, we wouldn't start them on milk and we wouldn't try and, and uh, form a bond with them or get them used to people. We would immediately put them in with another group of rhinos and they actually teach the tamer rhinos to be more wild, which is really, it's worked really well in the past, so yeah. So what is it like on graduation day? Are there tears flowing down? Are there uh, celebrations? Oh, Walk it's a bit of work. Like the last time I was bawling my eyes out, but it was happy tears as well. So it's hard. Like you, you work that whole time because that's the goal. You know, you want to release them. Um, but it is very scary because you don't know what's going to happen to them. You don't know if they're going to be okay or, you know, are they going to survive out there? But the rhinos that we release are monitored 24 seven. There's always security with them. And then there's also, there's people that are doing research now on them. So yeah, there's always people watching them, which is good to know. And so when they are finally released into the wild, are they monitored or tracked? Uh, can you see the progress that they're, they, that they're surviving or how does it look like uh, after they're released? So yeah, they're, they're all monitored very closely just so we can see you know that they're doing well out there. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to release them and then something happens to them. Um, they obviously, like I said, they need protection from poachers. But then it is also important to monitor them to see their progress. It, how is the organization like funded? Do, are there donations that come through or government funding? Uh, yeah. So it's it's all based on donations. Um, so and sponsorships. 
So yeah. Ari, who's the the founder of the Rhino Orphanage, that's how he actually got it started. You know, he he got people to sponsor cement to build the Rhino rooms, and then he got a guy to sponsor air cons for each of the Rhino rooms. So he's really good at that, actually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it runs all on donations, and then there's also a Rhino adoption program that's on the website, so you can virtually adopt one of the Rhinos and pay a monthly fee towards them. Um, it helps to just contribute to everything. Rhino milk is very expensive. That is the dry food, actually. Well, how did the founder or the organization actually get started? Uh, well, so Ari got a call about a baby rhino that had been orphaned, and he tried to phone around to find a place that could take it and hand raise it, and he actually couldn't find a place. So, yeah, it was then and there that he decided to build a rhino orphanage. And I mean, so many rhinos have gone through the rhino orphanage. So I think without him, you know, I don't know what would have happened to them. So yeah, he's amazing. Any future aspirations to maybe have your own orphanage center? <laughs> Definitely. So yeah, when I eventually finish studying, um, I'd love to go work with other wildlife vets and gain some experience. But then the ultimate goal is to also open my own rehab slash rhino orphanage, or no, everything orphanage, should I say. Uh, yeah, I want to be able to take in any kind of wild animal in, in South Africa that's been injured or orphaned. And um, yeah, luckily then being a vet, I would be able to treat it there and then hopefully release it again. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You have people just, you know, young people just trying to go make money or getting business degrees. <laughs> build a bunch of wealth it's just inspiring to see somebody's you know ultimate goal is just to help animals and give back where does that come from the, this, the drive and passion um i don't know since i was a kid i've always been driven towards animals i mean people have often asked what would i do if i didn't work with animals and i have no idea i, I wouldn't be doing anything i can't think of anything i just it's such a rewarding job like it's hard to explain um sometimes but it's just it's amazing it's amazing and it like consumes your life it, it becomes your life that's the best part so yeah oh, we have a question here uh from mark has had a quick question saying has the lockdown had any impact on the orphanage so far um yes it's had an impact on the just the volunteers um mm -hmm. because they were getting a lot of volunteers in from overseas obviously now people can't come so they've had to look for volunteers from south africa more and then even south africa i mean we've had our own lockdown you can't travel into the different provinces. So I think that's also been a bit of a struggle. Mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit more what, what you're doing now. You, you mentioned that you overstended your stay at the orphanage for way longer than you were supposed to stay and you're gone after three years. What are you up to now? Uh, so now I'm studying veterinary medicine um, and it's amazing. It was a really hard decision to make. So yeah, when I was at the Rhine Orphanage, I didn't have any intention of leaving. I was ready to stay there forever. But eventually, you know, I, I figured, well, I saw that the best way to help rhinos is to go and study. I initially wanted to study vet nursing because here in South Africa, it's only two years. So I thought, that's great. I can go away for two years, come straight back to the rhinos. Um, but then I got into vet. So I kind of just thought it was meant to be. And I'm really, really glad that that opportunity came up because I can do so much more as a vet for these rhinos and, and the I mean, the rest of the wildlife in the country. Um, mm. So yeah, and I'm loving it. It is such an amazing course. I'm studying with all these people that are commenting. <laughs> They're crazy. But um, it's an amazing course. Like it's really, it's so much fun. And it's, yes, it's a lot to learn. It's a lot of studying, oh my goodness. But if yeah. anyone ever wants to study vet, it's definitely a good idea. And if somebody was interested in, for example, applying for one of these volunteer programs, where would you recommend they look? And would you also, uh, are there any red flags that people should watch out for when applying for these kind of orphanages or volunteer centers? Uh, well, the, the biggest thing is to just do your research. So if you find a place that you think is going to be a great place to go volunteer, just make sure you do a lot of research. A big red flag is any kind of interaction with a predator. Um, I would even red flag any interaction with any wildlife because you just want to know like why are they allowing that interaction. Um, the biggest thing with rhino, uh, no, sorry, not rhinos, with predators, specifically lions, is this new thing, kind of new thing called canned hunting. So the lions are hand raised by volunteers that kind of get sucked into this without knowing what they're doing. 
And um, after that, they go to other parks where they're used for lion walks. And then when they're adults, they get put in a cage and shot. So, yeah, it's really horrible. Um, it's mainly for the lion bone trade, also in Asia. And you are easy lions are being used for? I have absolutely no idea. I know there was a, they were using tiger bones at some point, and now it's a lion bone thing. I have no idea what it's used for. I just, Oh, that's super sad. That's, that's really sad. Yeah. Well, uh, it's inspiring to see you trying to help yeah. out the rhinos and also raise awareness to not only the issue about endangered rhinos, but also the other animals that have been uh, as well destroyed by this poaching. Uh, so while we're wrapping things up on the show, we usually have a travel tribe toss up where we ask three questions and we just look for the first answer that comes to your mind. So are you ready? You're up for the travel tribe toss up? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, great. So uh, I love going out into the wild as well. I am, I've never been to Africa. So if someone was planning on going to Africa, where would you recommend they go to? What would you recommend they see and why? Okay, so specifically in South Africa, I would recommend the Kruger National Park um, just because it is my favorite place on the planet. It's amazing. You can stay, you can either pay more and stay at very fancy lodges where they take you on game drives, or you can do it all yourself and go and stay in huts with no electricity and nothing and just drive around the park yourself. Um, or you can even go on a trail where you've got all your stuff in a bag on your back and you walk through the bush with, with tour guides so that you don't get eaten by a lion or anything. Our uh, last guest, tourists and people coming to visit Africa than, than yeah. they're used to be. Yeah, Africa steals your heart. Your... Yeah, I'll have to, have to plan a visit out there soon. Question number two. You said that all you had a lot of experiences with these rhinos. What is the goofiest thing you've seen a rhino do? <laughs> uh, I've seen a baby rhino fall on its face, like a proper face plant. So they are really, they're silly, goofy, clumsy animals. I mean, that's that's the funniest part about them. And they love the rain. So they get really, really excited and start running around like crazy. And then they're, just, they're too big and clumsy on their feet. And they usually end up falling. Also because they run through the mud, which is slippery. And yeah, the best was one of the rhinos, Ollie. He actually, he face planted. His front legs gave out and he landed on his chin. It was very cute. Wow, cute. That would be horrible. All right. Uh, last question. If you could have your own PSA, your own public service announcement to help help the rhinos and help reduce and eliminate poaching, what would that PSA announcement be? Um, okay, so try and shorten this. Pretty much that I, I, I want people to see rhinos through my eyes. I want people to see that side that I always have got to see because they are remarkable animals. And a lot of people don't know that, you know, you don't see that when you go out to the bush. And yeah, I just want, the more people who see that side of them, the more people who want to fight for them. Um, the other big thing is is spreading, spreading the news about this, creating awareness so that everyone knows what's happening to the rhinos. A lot of South Africans don't even know what's going on with the poaching, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're going to throw in a bonus question just because it looks like your mom is here. Uh, and she <laughs> asked her about all the pets she had when she was little. <laughs> a lot. I've gone through all the animals. I've had everything. And at the moment, I still have lots of pets. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit animal obsessed. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Well, we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, if people wanted some more information about volunteering opportunities, uh, such as the Rhino Orphanage or anywhere else, where would you recommend uh, they look at? Um, so they can research, either go look at Facebook or Instagram pages of there's the Rhino Orphanage. Um, another really good one is Care for Wild. And then there's another orphanage called the Zululand Rhino Orphanage. Also do amazing work. Great. And then there's all, that's also the place where people can donate or sponsor these rhinos as well. Yeah, yeah. Saving the survivors is another one where they need donations. <laughs> Oh, very cool. Excellent. Well, Jamie, the Rhino Mom, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your incredible story and your passion for rhinos and animals. Uh, we were, we, I had a blast learning more about uh, the rhinos and what you've done, and I'm sure people uh, listening as well did. You have a great fan club here that's supportive of what you do. So thank you so much for coming on. And uh, oh, touch. yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Cool. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.